All righty, we are live, but we're going to count down here until we see the numbers in chat because a lot of people don't get here. Oh, okay, we're, we're at zero now in chat. Okay, I don't know if anybody can hear us, but we're at zero. We just have to wait for one of those numbers to show up. And then we know, ah, there we go. We're, yeah. we're back. And welcome, everybody. In the background, you can hear the wonderful frogs. And, and Insightful One, you said you had a complaint about the frogs? Yes. What did so, they say? That they have to turn off the show because of the froggies. No. Oh, my gosh. The froggies are the best. And that's where, remember, years ago, I taught you a phrase, which is bite me, frog boy. Now, I don't want to be rude to that that. uh listener. We want them back, of course. And I would never say bite me frog boy to that person, but it's a good chance. It's a good, uh, good way to remind everybody that that is a great way to get back at somebody that you don't like. Bite me. Frog boy. How dare they complain? Exactly. Burnt popcorn. How dare they? How dare they? Uh, we have our wrench carriers tonight. We have, oh yes, we love the overly romantic frogs. Yeah. In case you're wondering, thank you, Fluffy Muffin. In case you're wondering why they make all that noise, it's because romance is in the air and they're making polywogs, lots of them. So anyway, I want to welcome uh, Moonlight View and Four Sons Mom. They are the moderators for the Mad Chatters tonight. And of course, Mad Chatters are always out of control every night. You know how the drama just flows in and out of this chat. It's insane. But um, a little bit later on, we're going to continue reading the opening statements in the Scott Peterson trial. Why? Because the Innocence, the LA Innocence Project is trying to get the courts to let them test a bunch of items they found that they think is connected to the Lacey Peterson murder, and they think Scott Peterson is innocent. There are people now coming forward and saying, well, I think he's innocent too. I think he's innocent. He's not. He flat out is not. So, what we're just what we're doing is I'm going to read the opening statements of both sides and then maybe we'll read some testimony and then we'll read the closing statements because if you didn't follow the Scott Peterson case 20 years ago you may hear what they're saying about it and think well he might be innocent now again as we've talked about a million times I want them to test all those things in this van that they found like a mile away from Lacey Peterson's house that had a bloody mattress, had a hammer, for some reason they think is connected because they think Scott Peterson is innocent. He was the only one in San Francisco Bay that day. That was Christmas Eve, 2002. And um, he was the only one that was uh, in the appropriate area, if you will, to where Lacey and Connor's bodies, or Lacey had, Lacey's body had to be put into the ocean the waves took it and deposited Lacey and Connor onto a shore. And they're able to scientifically determine where her body had to be placed in the ocean for those waves to bring her to that approximate area of the shoreline. And who was there? Scott Peterson. Nobody else. Nobody. That in itself is enough. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, first, this just happened a, a few hours ago. Eric Crumbly's father was found guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. So hang on here one second. Um, now, he was the young man that took his gun to school and shot and killed four people. And um, the parents are being held. He was found guilty. Just a second. Let me just find this thing here. Uh, can you read a few things in chat while I grab something real quick? Yes, and Annie T makes a comment, and she's being funny. Yeah. She says, Scott Peterson is innocent. So is OJ. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, that's nice. Oh, and Mel Max here. Hey, I haven't seen them in a while that I've noticed. Sometimes oh, I don't get to see Mel. Yeah. yeah. Good to see you, Mel Mac. Okay, so yeah, um, James Crumbly, that's Eric Crumbly's father, was found guilty today. This happened in Michigan. Four people were killed. He was found guilty of four charges of involuntary manslaughter. Um, the jury uh, took two over two days to decide this, but they asked the judge 
rather than shut down for the day at the end of the business day, they said, can we keep going? Cause they were so close. They did find him guilty. Um, basically what, and his mother was found guilty as well. And basically what it was, the, the both juries, and I'm just wildly interpreting what they, what, uh, the evidence was here. Both juries came to the conclusion that <clears throat> there were many signs that Ethan Crumbly was very mentally disturbed and uh, they ignored them. They didn't get him the help that he asked and begged for, and they let him have a loaded weapon. That's the crux of it. He was found uh, guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Real quick in chat, um, Yes, thank you, Marilyn Landis. Stephen uh, Stephen Stern's trial is May 13th. Yeah, same day as Richard Allen. It's going to be crazy. But um, about uh, James Crumbly and his mother, Ethan's mother, what do you guys think? Do you think that that was right to charge the parents based on the evidence that you we've heard about? Uh, he the, the thing that was so frustrating is uh, the day that he was caught drawing pictures in class that upset the teacher so much and they called his parents in, went down to the principal's office. He was obviously very disturbed that day. He had the gun in his backpack and nobody thought to check it. Yeah. Nobody thought to check it. And the parents left him in school. Um, now some say that the school said it was okay for him to stay, but still. Now, I don't think anybody from the school has been criminally charged, but you know there's going to be huge lawsuits coming up. So let's see. Did you all think that charging the parents and both parents being found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, their son, Ethan, killing four people, do you think that was right? Uh, Pippi Longstocking says, absolutely. Burnt Popcorn says, uh, yes. Uh, Dee Dee Rosner says, yes, based on what we know. Marilyn Landis, yes. Yep, another Maria. Yes, I do. Marjorie Morse, yes, without a doubt. And uh, Pamela Maxfield, yes. Let's see, hold on here. Yes, this is a challenge to rogue males who have always been able to do whatever they like that is cruel. Well, it's also a challenge to parents to not give your kids access to loaded weapons when they're asking for help because they feel uh, suicidal and homicidal and, and are ill. And yeah. If I remember correctly, in um, Ethan's mother's trial, what they insinuated basically that these these text messages and such, they were just like, this is how they kidded around, you know. Oh, I'm, I, I, I can't remember what they said, but, uh, you know, I feel like killing myself today or whatever. And they, she said that's just was them basically kidding around. From what I saw, none of it was funny. I, I can't, and, you know, my son and I, I mean, we're, we're both pretty, we kid around all the time and we can be kind of twisted sometimes, but never anything like what they were doing. Never. Right. So I don't know. What do you think inside for one? Oh yeah. I think there's a reason the jury found them guilty. Yeah. And you know, people, you know, there's a point, there are things absolutely we're responsible for as parents. And in this case, I think, you know, like you said, he was crying for help and people need to pay more attention. We know so much about the mental health with everybody these days. People mm -hmm. need to take it seriously and get their children help. And maybe this will help some people to do that. Exactly. And for Popcorn says, if you watch the trial, it was so obvious. Now, the problem is most a lot of people, most people don't have health insurance, let alone mental health insurance. Your local governments yeah have they should have what's called a sliding scale you can call up your local mental health facility and you can tell them how much you can afford to pay and then that's what they'll charge you five bucks or whatever there is help there's 911 if you have to there's a suicide hotline there are things you can do but one of the biggest things you can do is not give your child access to a loaded weapon okay if they if the Crumblies would have taken that gun away and made sure it was locked up where Ethan couldn't get it, this would not have happened. It is that simple. So, yes. Also, if you go through your school for help, you can get free help. There you go. Yeah. 
There you go. Exactly. Uh, Claire, the fact that they ran made them look awful, too. Yeah, they did. And then later they said they weren't really running, but they did. They tried to run and hide. April B., yes, they ignored their son's cries for help. They need to be more accountable for their poor parenting decisions. Again, keeping a gun in an in a area where a child can get it, right there, right there. That is your, your biggest mistake, your biggest mistake. Oh, and Vanessa, I'm glad you're back. Now, Vanessa is um, one of the people that believes Scott Peterson is innocent. And Vanessa says, Lacey might not have been put in the bay on Christmas Eve. Once Amber came out, it was all of the news where Scott was that day. Anybody could have dumped her body there and framed Scott Peterson. Okay, let me tell you why that isn't true. Because Scott Peterson said he was there. He proved he was there. And there was nobody else there. Witnesses saw nobody else. All right. And for Lacey to end up where she did. Now, this is what I understand. From For Lacey to end up where she did, she had to be put into the bay on that day in that area based on the tide charts. And believe me, people that are a bazillion times smarter than me understand all that. But that is my interpretation of it. Also, that, the condition of her body. It, and from, yes, and from the condition of her body. Yes. Exactly. I was reading about that yesterday. And then today I was watching uh, Laura Engel speak, who's followed the case since day one. Mm -hmm. And she went to Janie Peterson's house and she said, uh, Janie has her evidence boards up. And Janie's theory is the burglars did it. Those two burglars that were caught. And they, they well, they weren't caught. They turned themselves in, if I remember correctly, and said, hey, we're the burglars. We didn't murder Lacey. You know, and and didn't we determine that they did the burglary on the 26th? Didn't we determine that yesterday? That's what the detectives say. Yes. Yeah. So, again, it doesn't. They were cleared. Believe me, the police would have loved the burglars to have been the killer of Lacey Peterson. Oh, but yeah, that would have been so much easier. Easier. It would have been handled. They wouldn't have had to deal with Scott and his baloney. But no. And it, her family would have preferred that too. anything but her husband. They loved Scott. Yeah. Absolutely loved him. And again, this is all Janie Peterson's stuff. This is mm -hmm. all, Vanessa, what you're telling us comes straight mm -hmm. from Janie Peterson's website, scottpetersonappeals.org. And... It's baloney. We went through the top 20 questions that you had to answer, you know, to that I guess was supposed to show Scott's innocence. We went through them a couple of nights and it was hilariously easy and ridiculous. Remember that insightful one? It well, was just were the most asinine questions. It, yeah. yeah. Like, really. how do you know Lacey's um, body was in the in the back of the truck uh, or was it in the boat? How do you know? I don't know. In the toolbox. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, it could have been any of it. Yeah, the they could, it could have been anywhere. And, you know, like they never answer questions like Scott Peterson bought 50 pounds worth of cement. Where did that all go? Well, there's uh, evidence that he made anchors and the anchors are missing except for one. Right. But he never tells you. Well, he did say that he spread the, um, the cement out on the driveway or the sidewalk. There was no evidence of that. He didn't do that. He, well, bought the he, he did, but it didn't match. Oh, is that it? He didn't cement, it? Right. Is okay. made by the anchors. Yeah, they tested the cement. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, we'll get into that here in just a little bit. I have two things I want to get here. I hate morning says I saw a post today asking for another place to get emergency mental help because that state line was busy and that is horrible. And you know what? Uh Anastasia Buckler, this is the bazillion dollar question. When do we hold the government accountable? Wait a minute. Did I do that? No, I did it. I didn't know you were reading it. Sorry. I was. You're fired, young lady. You are fired. You are fired. Okay. I know which comment it was. Okay. I know. I'm just kidding. Here it is. I got it. Uh, whoops. Okay. When do, we, <laughs> when do we hold the government accountable for lack of insurance and mental health? I, I, I agree. That, but again, that will take pretty much a revolution in this country yeah. to get decent mental health care. If we had decent mental health care, we wouldn't have the homeless problem, but that's a whole other story. 
So, and I'm just kidding you, insightful one. You're not fired. You can never leave me. Just know that you are stuck with me for life. It's like a cult. You can't leave. End of story. <laughs> ever, ever, ever. So, um, Vanessa, what's in his innocence motion? Oh, the um, what she mentioned about oh. people, which like the innocence motion is all the stuff that they went through years ago and he went to trial and he was convicted even though that stuff was there except the bloody mattress and the hammer they want to test for dna right so, yeah. and and remember the in yeah. right the la innocence project what they presented to the court was their side okay yep. they don't have to prove it they don't have to prove it to be factual yep. and so if you read it as a factual document it looks amazing but again they had these people they had the names of these people during the trial and Mark Garagos didn't call them. Why? Because he was smart enough to know that their stories didn't work. They would have fallen apart on the stand again. And we're going to get to his opening statement. And when you hear it, I want you to picture him just with his chest puffed out and just marching and, you know, barking these orders. And you believe that he is going to find, make sure that the jury finds Scott Peterson innocent. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. There are some stories here I want to update you on really quickly, okay? Let me grab them here. Uh, really quickly, you know, sweet Elijah Vu, okay? Well, there's a little bit of an update, and I want to put his picture up here. So hang on. Let me grab it real quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look at that sweet baby. Uh, this is the sweet three-year-old that the mother gave to her boyfriend because she wanted him to be disciplined and to learn behave more like a man. He was three people, three. And I say was because he is dead. Elijah Vu, mother, boyfriend, appear in court as search continues for missing Wisconsin taught. Now they are continuing the search. Uh, Katrina Bauer and Jesse Bang are accused of child neglect with Bauer also facing additional charges of obstructing officers. So um, now Bang is eligible for a public defendant and I'm sure he that Bang is going to get one. Uh, now, Elijah was last seen on February 20th at, his apart, at the apartment and uh, uh, he just vanished. Uh, Bauer, that is, hold on one second, let me make sure I got this right. Katrina Bauer, that's his mother. Uh, was also arrested and charged with being a party to child neglect. Bang said Bauer allowed Elijah to stay with him for several weeks, starting February 12th for, quote, behavioral issues. Now, there is a reward that has been uh, up, and I think it's to $40,000 now. So, I mean, then there they are. Hold on. Am I doing this right this second here? No, I'm not. Hold on. Just one second. There we go. Let me show you their pictures. Look at that sweet baby. Oh my God. I know. They, so cute. Ew. Monsters. Just monsters. So we'll keep you updated on that. And never forget this mother handed this sweet little baby over to this boyfriend to discipline, to teach him to be a man. And he was three people. He was three, for God's sakes. Ugh. Makes me crazy. Yeah. Okay, this is the latest that we have on um, on Riley Strain. Uh, he went missing missing from a Nashville bar, Luke um, Luke Bryan's bar, and uh, they believe they they've said that they're looking into him being overserved. Now they're investigating whether University of Missouri student Riley Strain was overserved alcohol at the Nashville bar when he was asked to leave that night. He vanished. Uh, we've shown you videos of Riley Strain walking and then bumping into like a big post and falling down. He was obviously very, very drunk. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, please just keep your eye out for Riley Strain. It scares me to death because he was headed toward, they say he was headed toward a river. Now they have had boats on the river searching. Nothing has turned up. I, uh, I read today that they found a shoe that they think belonged to him. But uh, I don't know any more than that, so I need to I need to look that up. That they think they found one of his shoes. So uh, again, 
as unlikely as it is, miracles happen. And Elizabeth Smart, that's my mantra, Elizabeth Smart. Everybody thought she was dead, including me. But stranger things have happened. We'll just keep our fingers crossed on that. So hang on here. Uh, gambler, mom is given a court date. Yeah, I just read it and it, of course, just went right out of my brain. So I'm sorry, but we'll, we'll keep that. Uh, we'll keep that. We'll keep looking at that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Vanessa has a great question, according to Annie T. Um, would the Columbine parents be convicted if that happened today? It's interesting to think about. Oh, I absolutely think they would be. I, I think they would be. No question. I mean, they were building bombs in uh, one of them can't remember which one in the bedroom, you know, and, yeah. but, and they allowed them access to, to guns and everything. However, I don't believe either one of them was crying out for help like Ethan Crumbly. And I think that's the difference. I think Ethan Crumbly was begging for help and drawing these horrible pictures. I right. think Columbine yeah. kids kept all of that from their parents. Although I do think they very well could have been uh, charged and convicted today. But again, I'd have to go back and look. That was so long ago. Yeah, uh, they I'll seem to be sneaky, those, the Columbine were, boys. Yeah. They were very sneaky and they didn't come out and say, we, we need help like Ethan did. You know, Ethan was begging for help and that's the problem. That is absolutely the problem. Red Like Wine again, where's the bio dad? I'm assuming you're talking about Elijah. Uh, I have not heard where the bio dad is. I, I don't know. Has anybody heard I'm not, I'm not sure because if he's spoken yet, because I keep getting the cases mixed up between Sebastian and Elijah oh, about the it, parents. Yeah. It's so hard. I have not heard anything about Elijah's father, but um, we can we can look that up. Um, can you uh, chat for a moment? I need to go turn yeah. my air conditioner on because it's starting to it's starting to get hot in here. I'm going to faint. So hang on. Marlene, do you mean Elijah's father? I don't know. Let's see. Okay. When like Wannigan says, I'm so glad I'm not the only one who mixes these cases up. Oh, I oh, constantly do. Yeah. Recently, we've had ones that are so similar. And when it comes to... Uh, family dynamics like a step parent and then the father is not living and with them and then a child is missing that i'm right now i can't remember because remember at first we also had madeline soto's oh yeah you know, those interviews and so i right now they're just all so close together i kind of mixed all of those interviews up i know yeah it's um two people have said they heard the father's in prison Oh, okay. Well, there you go. There you go. Hold on. What the hell? Why do I have an advertisement here? The Tennessean. Come on. Thank you, Marlene, and gazing at the moon. Yes, thank you, Marlene. Thank you, thank you, and gazing at the moon. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, here is the latest that was posted today, that late this afternoon, from the Tennessean. This is about Sebastian Rogers. Now, he is the boy that has autism that supposedly just walked out of the house. So uh, nobody has been arrested. Uh, the mother and the stepdad, gosh, I want to make sure I get this. I get this one and Madeline, uh, so Madeline Soto mixed up. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Sebastian is that sweet boy uh, who remember the stepfather said they ran a very strict household, a very strict household. And that, for some reason, just bothered me. But anyway, those search efforts have been scaled back. Tennessee authorities say they remain committed to finding Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers, the 15-year-old Hendersonville boy who was reported missing almost three weeks ago. But leads remain sparse, and officials were vague when it came to discussing the teenager's whereabouts this week as investigators continue to seek clues in a case that sparked a statewide Amber Alert and triggered the search of a Kentucky landfill without success. Sebastian was last seen February 26 near Stafford Court in Hendersonville. The boy's family said he walked out of their Henderson home between midnight and 6 a.m. and they learned he was missing when his mother Katie Proudfoot tried to wake him up for school. 
Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. There have been no sightings of Sebastian and no evidence pointing to his whereabouts as of today, officials said. An investigation into the Rogers case has been running concurrently since search and rescue efforts began. TBI spokesperson Susan Nyland said on Wednesday, though she remained vague about the nature of the investigation and whether the case has turned criminal. Now, they have said uh, it was Nathan. Oh, gosh, that reporter. Who's that reporter that might come on our show? Barris. Um, who? Barris. Barris. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he has said that his sources are saying that they are looking into this case, turning it into perhaps foul play. So TBI agents and intelligence analysts are pursuing leads in the case after receiving more than 100 tips about Sebastian. The TBI said Sebastian was wearing a black sweatshirt, black sweatpants, and glasses at the time he went missing. Now, um, uh, Nathan Barris is a, a, an amazing guy. In fact, I will tonight put the, um, uh, sorry, put the link to his Facebook page up so you can uh, see one of the, he did like this 45 minute talk talking about the case. And it's just fascinating what he has to say. And he says that, uh, officials are now looking at this as a possible foul play case. Um, it's very strange that there is no trace of him, that he's on no cameras anywhere. Um, yeah. he, he left without his shoes. Uh, there's just something very, very funky about this case. And, um, but nobody, nobody is suggesting anything. It's just weird. Now, this was the case, God, I hope I have the details right, where his stepfather was actually out of town when he went missing, supposedly, at work, and his mother was home with him. Um, they were on the phone for like two hours on the Sunday night before he went missing. And we don't know where he was working. We don't know if that was a normal thing for them to talk that long. We don't know anything about it. So hang on here. Let me just do this real quick. They've used I just wanted to mention the reporter's name is Nick Barris. Nick Barris. I said Nathan. Yeah. Nick Barris. Nick I'll Barris. I'll put Nick his Barris. link in chat. Yes, please. Oh, please do. That'd be great. Now, let me tell you, they've searched everywhere, people. They've searched storm drains, garages, crawl spaces, and um, they have aircraft, drones, SWAT teams, night vision, canines, horseback, they have done everything and they haven't found a thing. Now, Sebastian's stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, said during a live stream interview that his family has been harassed since the team went missing because he is involved in a custody battle in another case. And he is. He's involved in a custody battle with his daughter that's been going on for five years. And it's really nasty. OK, and I will tell you the one thing is he was ordered to take parenting classes. Um, now, this is what I read. I have not researched it, but the mother was not ordered to take parenting classes. He was, just saying. So anyway, the other thing that he did, he said that they had been cleared. Uh, Proudfoot, Chris Proudfoot said they had been cleared. That is not true. Now, the police have not come out and said Chris Proudfoot is lying, but they have not come out and said anybody is cleared. Now, they have said that the Proudfoots have been cooperating with the police, absolutely cooperating, no problem. And uh, But he just was adamant that they've been cleared, and that is not the case. That lie bothers me. It really bothers me. Right. So anyway, uh, that is the, the latest on that. So... Let's see. Oh, uh, Marlene Claussen. Let me just read this. Uh, Jimmy Vu's Ila, Jimmy Vu, Elijah's uh, biological father, has been in prison in, at Oshkosh Correctional since 2023. Wisconsin court records show Bauer filed a paternity and child support action in 2022 against Jimmy Vu. Okay, got it. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Marlene Claussen. Again, thank you, Marlene keeping us all up to date here. The stepfather's story is he was working in Memphis. The police have not said that 
that is incorrect. They've uh, they've had nothing but good to say about uh, uh, Sebastian's mother and stepfather and his biological father. There's been nothing negative about any of them. So, yeah. So anyway, and, and Sean, I know what you mean, but I found it interesting that the court ordered him to take parenting classes and not the mother. It's like, what happened? What what caused that to kick in? That's all I'm saying. That is kind of a standard thing if there's ever any issue with the child. But right. But even in the high school, um, if your child goes to a counselor with an issue, like health wise or anything, they'll ha ask you if you want to take parenting classes and give it to you. Right. So, yeah. But from what I read, he was ordered to take it. She yeah. wasn't. And that I thought was weird because I would assume you would order both to take it, to take parenting classes. Now, uh, Vanessa Monroe says Sebastian's stepfather has a history of domestic violence. I don't believe there's any record. Is there any police record of um, Sebastian's stepfather? Because I have not seen that at all. See, there is one parent, and I can't remember which one, a step parent that has mm -hmm. a perfectly spotless record, no charges ever, but I can't remember which one it is. So I need to look that up again. It probably is Sebastian because I'll tell you why. If know. there had been domestic violence, I think we would have heard a lot about it, a lot about it, you know? Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, I'm just you saying. Would hear that. Oh yeah, yeah, people would have posted the record and everything online. Oh, it would have been a big deal. Yeah, yeah. a really big deal. So absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'll tell you what. Now, I'm going to start reading uh, more of the closing arguments from where we left off yesterday with the prosecution in the Scott Peterson trial. Okay, uh, now, if anybody has any questions, um, insightful one, I'll be reading, so I won't be able to stop and see. If there's questions, just interrupt me, and we can stop and answer them, okay? Because okay. I want people to know the details of this case. So when you hear about the LA Innocence Project, and if you read their documents and you go, wow, he's really innocent. No, he's not. I want to stress again, they had access to these names. Mark Garagos, Peterson's lawyer, said they were going to call all these witnesses that saw Lacey walking Mackenzie, their dog, after Scott left for the bay. And not one witness was called, not one. And uh, now they're trying to say that they have all these witnesses, although there is one witness that they claim says that uh, she was basically coerced <clears throat> by the detectives to change her story about seeing Lacey, you know. So, uh, and yeah, Marlene Clausen, oh. you can have domestic violence without police reports, but we can't, um, we can't, you know, say whether it's true or not without the official police report. So anyway, uh, Pamela Maxfield says the LA Innocence Project receives federal funding to do to do what they do. Okay, that's good. Hey, I have no no problem with the LA Innocence Project. I'm just stunned that they think Scott Peterson is a case that they should, I'm sorry, waste their money on, you know. And I really, really hope that they let them test the uh, the DNA tests on the hammer, on the grocery bag, on the uh, on the mattress, on the blood. We'll test it all, and when it comes back, not to be Lacey or Connor or Scott or anybody else connected to the case, then we can put that to rest. Now they did do a big push for a new trial, and I thought they just might get it, but. The judge turned it down. That doesn't mean that maybe they can't refile and keep trying. So, you know, meant to mention because we were talking about if he was in the boat or the truck. Mm -hmm. And years ago, there was a woman that said she saw something in the back of Peterson's truck. The Modesto B wrote an article about it. Yeah, I remember that. I don't think she was called as a witness, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She saw something that was covered up in his truck. A uh, flying DJ 01 says, am I remembering incorrectly? I thought there was a second girl walking a dog that was not Lacey. There well, was. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, there was a pregnant woman um, and she testified in court. Now, she's not sure if she was walking the dog on that particular day, 
but she was a pregnant woman that walked the neighborhood and had a golden retriever. Right. And she looked a lot like Lacey. She did look like Lacey. Yeah, she yeah. did. She did. So, you know, again, that could have, uh, if they bring witnesses, maybe they that's who they saw. But I'm telling you, nobody saw Lacey Peterson walking Mackenzie after Scott left the house that day. Didn't happen because she was already dead. Or if she wasn't dead, she was unconscious. And so. just to clarify on that one lady who said she was pushed or co co coerced mm -hmm. into saying, uh, she was coerced into saying she saw Lacey. So uh, wasn't it the defense or their, their investigators? That pushed her oh, I that? thought I thought she was saying she saw Lacey and the detectives told her got, supposedly talked her out of that. That's what I thought. Oh, well, and it might you know what? And it might be both. It was the other way. They were telling her to say she saw her. Oh, OK. And so and when she didn't. Yeah, got that's it. what I remember. So that may, leads me to think it was the defense side. But we will double check. I'll double check that information. Yeah, I think yeah. in the uh, L.A. Innocence Project filing they have that in there somewhere that I was reading that, that yeah. there was a woman that the detectives talked out of course or into saying that she didn't see Lacey. Sorry, I had to take out those earrings because they were killing me. Okay. I found that. Yeah. Online yesterday too. And then I can't remember for sure. So I'll double yeah. check again. It's yeah. our memories and it's not because, well, I am an old bat, but I'm <laughs> telling you, it's just, my brain has so many facts and it's just like mm -hmm. overflowing and some just fall out and I can't remember any of them. So um, now Vanessa, I says there was a woman who knew Lacey from the doctor's office and saw her walking her dog that day. Why wasn't she called as a witness? Unfortunately, eyewitness accounts are highly oh. false. Yeah. And then it's very easy to plant that in your head, for example, and there's whole science behind it why we do this. Like we'll have memories of something that didn't happen or remember mm -hmm. it differently. And you'll like if, okay, if you're walking down the street and you think you see somebody, but somebody mentions, shows a picture or somebody's missing you. Oh my God, that's the person yeah. I saw or even exactly. if it wasn't. Yeah. it's Exactly. And Vanessa says it's in the innocence motion. Again, yeah. the question is, why wasn't she called to the witness stand by Mark Garagos, a million dollar yeah. highest paid defense attorney, best defense attorney in California at the time? All Why these were aware, they were aware at the time, they were, these people were talked to. Also, and when it comes to a court case, you're only hearing the defense side. Mm -hmm. um, these things can be easily explained when you hear the, the state side um, and the evidence given for why this is how it was. Yes. You know, but when you only hear one side of an argument, it is convincing that's their job. That's what they do. Exactly. And and the thing is, if I read the Innocence, L.A. Innocence Project's court documents and didn't really know much about the case, I'd be like, thank God that L.A. Innocence Project is doing this for Scott Peterson. That man's innocent, you know. But anyway, um, and, and maybe, yeah, witnesses did see a pregnant woman with a dog, but not Lacey. There was a pregnant woman. There were 14 a... people that said um, they saw a pregnant or overweight woman, but they mm -hmm. didn't say Lacey, and that's why they weren't called up. There you go. There you go. So, okay, we're going to, I need to um, put my avatar up because... Um, I have to like, you know, when I'm reading like that, I have to wipe my mouth and drink water and it's just disgusting. It would ruin your appetite. So hang on here. Mm -mm -mm. I don't want to stop the, I need to go out and come back in guys. So hang on. Yeah, there's a lot of cases that if you just hear one side, you think, oh my gosh, it could be innocent. And then you'll hear the state side saying, okay, well, here's the evidence of this. Here's this person's alibi. Here's this. And you're like, oh, it's like a documentary that only gives you one side. You have to go look at both sides. Yes, you do. And that if, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but the A&E, I think it was a four or six part documentary a few years ago, was a disgrace. Absolute oh, yeah. disgrace. They lied. They withheld information that would have changed the whole narrative. It just yeah. makes me so angry. So 
Oh, hang on. That's why yeah, that yeah. documentary went down here, hill real quick to anybody that knew about it because yeah. you know when they, they were saying things that weren't true and most of us knew what, you know, was factual in the case or not. And you know, it's so sad because I remember growing up and when there was a documentary, a you believed it. Man. Yeah, yeah, you believed it. But I mean, not now. You can't. You, you just can't. And A&E, I, they were so much better. I mean, this was, you know, the channel that had Dan Abrams on and Bill Curtis and people that you respected. But whoever did that A&E Scott Peterson documentary, they obviously yeah. did it to, um, you know, lie and get ratings. And they lied in that documentary. It was just shocking. Hey, Beth B, you made it. I'm so happy. I'm glad you're here just in time for the reading. So hi, Deborah Barron. So anyway, let's see here. here we go. All righty. Okay. I am going to get my documents up here. And where did they go? Hang on. I pulled them up. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. Now let's see here. Let me make sure I've got it. Hang on. Um, let me make sure. Let me just pull up here. Make sure I'm starting at the right place. Let's see. Okay. Okay. The last thing I said last night was Scott couldn't tell the officers what he was fishing for or really what type of equipment he was using to catch fish. What kind of bait I guess you would use the circumstance of Lacey's being missing. He said he left home at 930 and they brief the detective that arrived, Burkini, they, He's a homicide detective. They told him all of that. Now, this is the prosecution's opening statement. And we're going to continue with this right after I grab my drink here. Take okay. a big old swallow. I'm muting myself while you talk because I'm out okay. back right now with the froggies. So. Okay. And if you see someone with a question, just go, hey, and I'll stop. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, here we go. Mm -mm -mm. Make sure I got this correctly. Let's see. And then Detective Burkini does what detectives do. He's going to tell you he starts the investigation. And he starts it in the exact same way the patrol officer does. Started a missing persons case with the last person who saw the missing person. In this case, Lacey. And the last location that she was seen. Already he knows that. He introduced, he's introduced to Scott. He talks to him. He gets the basic story just very briefly again from him. He then asks him, do you mind if I go through the house and look basically for the same things that Officer Lessinger and Spurlock and Evers were looking for? Scott says he can. And he walks up to the door. He sees a mop out in the front. A mop and a mop bucket with a little bit of water there. And two mops by the front door. He goes inside. He looks through the house. Nothing's out of place. You're going to see pictures of what it looked like in a minute. He goes again through the house. He asks him if Lacey's personal belongings are here. And Scott says they are. He takes him back where they already looked in the bedroom and again opens up the purse, sees the items in there, in the closet, in the clothes closet, closes it up. He then says, you're out fishing today? And Scott says he was. And he says, would you mind taking me and showing me your boat? And he's going to tell you that he wanted to see Scott's boat that day. I mean, on the 24th. And Scott says he can. When they go back outside, before they leave to go, he said, would you mind if I look in Lacey's car and your car for any type of anything that might, might have helped us figure out what happened to Lacey? Scott says he can. So he goes to Lacey's car and he opens the doors. He looks inside. He finds Lacey's cell phone. It's plugged into a little console cigarette lighter. He tries to power it, power it and finds out it doesn't have any power and it won't hold a charge. Only works if the car is on. So the cell phone itself is not powered up. He looks through Lacey's Land Rover, doesn't find anything else. Doesn't find anything else of interest, he says, and then shuts the door. He then goes back to Scott's truck and he opens up the door. And when he does, the door, the car.
car that you're going to see, the cars that were parked very close together. When he opens up the passenger door, sorry, when he opens up the driver's door of Lacey's truck, I mean Scott's truck. Okay, so the prosecution is getting a little confused here. So basically, when he opens up the driver's door of Scott's truck, it bangs against the door of Lacey's car. You know, they're close together. He opens it, bangs up this, and Scott tells him, hold on. He says, I'll move the truck for you so it doesn't bang against the door anymore. And he says, well, you know, that's okay. I'll, I'll be a little more careful. And he says, wait, let me get a glove. He actually goes in, gets a leather glove, and he puts it between the door and his pickup truck and Lacey's car. Okay, I want to stop there. Your wife is missing. She's pregnant, eight months pregnant. And you're worried about them doing a ding to your car. You have to get a leather glove to put between the car door that's opening and your truck. Are you kidding me? God almighty. Sorry. I think I lost my place. So, um, the, te the detective then looks through the interior of the truck and he finds a couple of things. He finds a loaded 22 handgun in Scott's glove compartment. He pulls it out and asks him about it. He says, what's with this? And Scott says, well, I, I put that there when I went pheasant hunting a couple of months ago in November and I just left it in the car. And Detective Brocchini is going to tell you that is actually a violation of the law to have a loaded handgun in your car. He's going to tell you that he seized it as evidence. Going to see pictures. It's a crew cab truck, four doors and a back seat. And he's looking through there. He finds a big green canvas bag. And in the canvas bag, he finds a camouflage jacket that Scott says he wore fishing that day. It's dry. He says he finds a big five-store bag, plastic bag, that you get the stuff in when you buy something from Big Five. It's got Big Five on there. It's got a receipt that says the items were purchased on December 20th. Inside this, he's got two saltwater fishing lures that are unopened and in the packages. You'll see those in a minute. And also on the receipt, he sees there was a fishing pole that was bought and about two day and a two day fishing license bought on December 20th. He leaves all those items there in the bag. He then goes and looks in the bed of Scott's truck and he looks through and he sees a couple of things. He sees three large patio umbrellas, the kind people have, you, you put them in your backyard. Sometimes you've seen these farmer's markets, big canvas kind of patio umbrellas. He sees three patio umbrellas, the kind that people, oh, well, I already read that, hold on. Uh, da -da. Uh, three of those are wrapped up in a tarp, a blue tarp. He sees a brown canvas boat cover kind of wadded up and shoved in the back there. While he's looking in the back of the truck, you'll see Detective Brocchini. He's a short man. He's standing up on one step on the side of the truck. While he's doing that, he puts his keys on the wheel hump of the bed of the pickup truck. After he's done looking in there, he asks Scott, can we go to your shop now and see your boat? Scott says they can. They go out to get into Burkini's car, and Detective Burkini, Scott, and Officers Evers all go over to Scott's shop and, and the business, which is four or so miles away, and take a look at the boat. Hang on here. I need to move my paper down. When they get in there, Detective Burkini goes to start his car. He realizes he doesn't have his keys. He says he can't remember where he left them. He tells Scott, he says, I left my keys in your car. I need to look. Scott opens the truck back up. And they don't find him. He looks in the bed. He finds them where he left them, on the wheel hump. Gets back in his car, and they drive to the shop. When they get to the shop, you're going to see the pictures of the shop. It's in one of those strip malls, an industrial area, like a strip mall that you that has like little bay offices and, and bays, office bays, all the way down the line. There is kind of those metal put together kind of bay industrial, big industrial areas that, um, let's see, let's see, I got it, that you see when you, when they get there at this point, it's probably 11 o'clock at night on Christmas Eve. It's pitch dark, of course. There's not a soul around because nobody's going to be at a big bay door that you can open with a chain. There is a little, I call it, I mean, like, I call it like a man door. 
the door you walk into and out of the shop. And then there's a little door that they go in. They walk into the office of the shop. Scott unlocks it. They walk in. There is an office area. There is a wall and a window that's covered with a bunch of items. You will see a picture of that. There's another door that goes through there out into the bay portion of the shop. When they walk in, it's dark and they're looking, shining their flashlights. As they walk into the door, Scott says, well, uh, uh, there's no electricity in the shop. Detective Rokini is going to tell you he didn't question him about that, didn't even really pay any attention to it. What he really wanted to see is the boat. So they shine these flashlights. They walk through there. They go out into, into the bay area of the shop. And in there, they see, they, see, they see a couple of things. They see Scott's boat. It's a 14-foot aluminum boat open with a 15-horsepower outboard motor. It's got two seats. It's got a, I mean, a jump seat kind of in the front on the bench. Got a bench in the middle. And it's got a bench in the back with another jump seat where the driver of the boat can sit. And it's got a tiller outboard motor with a tiller. He also sees a big trailer. Got a bunch of stuff on it. There's kind of, when, when you walk out of the office here, you turn right. The trailer is right there. Kind of have to jump over the front of that little ball part of the trailer to get to where the boat is. In the back of the shop, it is just covered full of fertilizer product. In the very back of the shop, there's a bathroom that you really can't get to. It's packed full of fertilizer and stuff. When they walk in there, they go over to the boat. Detective Brocchini shines his flashlight in there, and he looks around and he sees some things. I'm going to show you in pictures in a minute, but it's dark. There are no lights on in the shop. He asks Scott, can you put up the bay door? He says, I'm going to shine my headlights here so I can get a better look. Scott says he will. He rolls up the bay door. Detective Brokini turns his car around so the headlights are focusing on the boat, and he takes six pictures. When he does that, he has his notebook, which he's been taking notes with, which he's been taking notes with as he is talking to Scott about what's going on. Letzinger and Evers, he did. Uh, it's some of this is typed weird, and I think it's just mistyped. So I apologize if sentences end strange. So anyway, he takes notes. He takes this notebook and puts it down in the bow of the boat. He does that. He puts it down so he can hold the camera and take a picture. He does that. You're going to see pictures in a minute where his notebook is there in the bow of the boat. And Detective Rokini is going to tell you he's a little embarrassed about what happens next. After they're done taking pictures, they all went back to the Modesto Police Department. They went back. Now, they closed the door, went back to the shop, locked it up, went all the way back to the Modesto Police Department, Officers Evers, Scott, and Detective Brocchini. And Detective Brocchini says, you know, I'd like to sit down with you. Now, it's probably midnight at this point, and take a very detailed statement, exactly what happened. He tells him, you know, I have to do that for a couple of reasons. You're the last person that saw her, and you're obviously someone who was close to her. And this is just part of the game. I mean, game is not the right word, just part of the drill, I should say. And Scott says, okay, no problem. I'll do that. As they're walking in, Detective Bocchini says, you know what? I forgot my notebook. He says, I can't take my statement from you unless I go over these notes we've been working on for the last two hours. Got to go all the way back to the shop, which they do. They get back in to Detective Bocchini's car. They drive all the way back to the shop four miles. And Scott opened the door for him. He goes, go ahead. He walks in, he goes through the door from the outside, back through the office door into the bay. Detective Rokini shining his flashlight over there, shining, shining it around, looking where he left his notebook. He shines it. They see it there in the boat. Scott hops over the trailer, like I told you he had to do, runs over, grabs the notebook off, hands it back to Detective Rokini and says, here you go, now we can go. And that's what they do. They go out of the shop. They go back to the Modesto Police Department, and Detective Rokini takes a detailed statement from the defendant. I, if he doesn't mention something here in a minute, I'm going to mention it because it's kind of interesting. It's actually really interesting. So hang on here. I want to go to the computer, not walk around so much. So I'm going to be a little static here. 
Let's go to December 24th. We can take a look at exactly what Scott told Detective Rokini he did that day. He said this, he decides to go fishing that morning because it's too cold to go golfing. He told Officer Evers that as well. He told Sergeant Evers it was a morning decision. I'm sorry, I'm going to block your way. He said it's a morning decision. And go ahead, check on that fishing. Here are the options here in the area. You aren't familiar with the fishing options available to the people in Modesto, but here are the places that Scott could have gone fishing that morning when he decided to do that. There's a fishing area, Fox Grove. It's an area that is nine miles away, has facilities for a 14-foot aluminum, aluminum boat, and then 23 miles away is Turlock Reservoir. It's another place you can go fishing. You can go fishing 19 miles away at Modesto Reservoir. Each of these locations is not far from the house. 26 miles away is Mossdale Crossing. 23 miles away is Woodward Reservoir. You can see that there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other locations where locations that you could go fishing in near Modesto in a boat the size the defendant had. Instead, the defendant chooses that morning to drive 86.2 miles, almost 90 miles from Modesto late in the morning to Berkeley Marina. That's where he tells Detective Brocchini. That's what he tells Detective Brocchini. This is what he decides to do when he's going to go fishing. He leaves home, you can see after 9.30, what you are going to hear from a woman by the name of Kristen Reed. He tells, Scott told Officer Evers, Officer Spurlock, Detective Brocchini, Detective Grogan, and I think that's it. He told all these people over a course of a bunch of different days that he left his home at 9.30 that morning. That's what he says. You're going to hear from a woman by the name of Kristen Reed, who is a friend of Scott and Lacey's. And what she's going to tell you is on December 24th, she actually is driving to, driving to work that morning. She's running late. She knows exactly what time it was. She drove past the defendant's house and their house at the end of the street. She lives on Covina, goes down this way. She's driving straight. She looks out of her passenger window. So she drove by just out of habit to see if there was someone there. She said she did that. She's going to tell you she did that because if she had seen the defendant or Lacey, she was going to go down and say hi or something to them since it was Christmas Eve. She knows what their cars look like. He, she knows exactly what time it is because I looked at my clock right before I looked up it, and it was 939 she did this. She said she looked out the window there and she says Lacey's car was parked in the drive and Scott's truck was parked in the drive. Go ahead, click on 930. When the officers went back and checked the defendant's cell phone records to see what his cell phone activity was on that particular day, they found out some information about when he left his home. Let me explain how cell phones work. When you pick up your cell phone and power it on, just turn it on, nothing happens. Nobody can track you. Nobody knows where you are. Nobody knows anything. When you call somebody and your phone connects somewhere, it connects uh, other cell phones to you. That's how it works. And the cell phone and the phone company in your records, it records what cell phone tower you're using. The cell phone towers have radiuses that they cover. So if you are in this, if I'm in this cell phone tower radius, I'm talking to someone and I move. And as I'm driving down the road to this one, the cell, the cell phone company transfers you from one cell phone tower to the next. That's how it works. Bounces you along. You don't know that it does it. All seamless. Seems like you are on one call That's and that's what's happening. And that's what's happening. It is recording your cell phone towers where you are. Bang, bang, bang. Okay. And also does that if you connect to your voicemail. If somebody calls you and leaves you a voicemail, it doesn't do that. If you call your voicemail, you actually have to connect to the phone company through a cell phone tower. So if you call your voice, voice if you call your voicemail on a cell phone, the company knows where, within what, within the radius, where the phone is being used. Okay, hang on. I need to take a drink here. Um, insightful one. Any uh, any questions or anything in chat? Um, no. Somebody brought up that people are discussing about if Lacey knew about 
Scott's affair with Amber, but and somebody asked if there was proof, but there's no proof Lacey knew about Amber. Yeah. Now, now Scott yeah. said he told her. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. but um, Lacey's mom is adamant that she did not know. She said Lacey would have told her, and that she would not have been able to hide it. That she would and have. Lacey's friends too. She yeah, had those three close girlfriends. Yeah, she would not have been able to hide it. She would have um, absolutely been devastated by this. So yeah, I don't think she knew. I don't think she knew at all. Okay, so let me continue. Let me pull this up here. Don't let me forget to tell you one thing about the uh, the storage unit where the boat was before we're done here, okay? Let's okay. see, Kristen Reed, what are we being used? Okay, let me pull this up. Like I said, this is all single space type, so I can get a little confused. Okay, anyway, talking about the cell phone and the towers and the prosecution continues. That's what happened this morning. At 10.08 in the morning, Scott called his voicemail. And what the cell phone records show is that he was within the radius of the cell phone tower that services his home. You're going to see he made a number of calls throughout the whole investigation. And wherever Scott was at his home, whenever Scott was at his home, he used the cell phone tower at 1250 Brighton Avenue. That's the tower that he used. At 10.08 in the morning, he made a call to his voicemail and he was pinging off the cell phone tower that services his home. So remember, Scott said he left at 9.30, everybody. But they're proving now that he didn't leave till at least eight minutes past 10 o'clock, if not later, based on these cell phone records. Okay, let's see. That call was one minute and 21 seconds long. That's how long it took him to check his voicemail that morning. During that call, a call transferred from the cell site that services his home to one at 10th and D Street. You can see from the chart, and I guess he has a chart up here, 10th and D Street is in the direction of his shop. There is a cell phone site tower at 10th and D Street. Investigator Steve Jacobson is going to talk to you during this trial about this phone stuff. He drove a police car from Scott's home in the direction of 10th and D Street cell phone tower. What he's going to tell you is he knows what the radiuses are covered by these cell phone towers. And it took him exactly 1 minute and 21 seconds to leave Scott's home driving his car just to normal speed within the speed limit to transfer to the next cell phone, the next cell, cell, uh, the next cell site tower, approximately one minute and 21 seconds. Exact amount of time Scott was on his phone checking his voicemail that morning. Now there's a big, uh, I'm about to talk to you about Martha Stewart and watching that show. And there was a big discrepancy on this and the prosecution screwed up and it looked like it would be devastating for the prosecution, but it wasn't. So we'll, we'll talk about that at some point. Uh, Scott tells Detective Brocchini that when he leaves, Lacey was watching the Martha Stewart show and he on the show remembers they were cooking something with meringue. When the Modesto Police Department ordered these shows for Martha Stewart for the 23rd and 24th, what they found was Martha Stewart didn't cook anything with meringue on the 24th. She actually cooked a segment at about 940. That show, I'm sorry, broadcast at nine o'clock. It's an hour long. At 940, 40 minutes into the show on the 23rd, she cooks a segment with meringue. He says that he remembers Lacey was doing this because that is her favorite show. That was the show she watched all the time. On the 24th, Martha Stewart didn't have a segment with meringue. Now, if I remember correctly, the prosecution was wrong about that. And uh, she did have a, a segment with meringue, just like Scott said. So that's where they got all like, all just all the Twitter that Scott was going to be found innocent now. Anyway, continuing on. The prosecution continues. He says when he left his house, Lacey was wearing a white long-sleeved shirt and black pants. He says she was getting ready to mop the floors and to walk the dog. Go ahead. This is the missing persons report that he gave to officers Evers. He gave the exact description. He says, you can see right here, that white long sleeve shirt and black pants. That's what he says. He also says she was wearing a diamond ring, diamond earrings, and a diamond necklace. He's very specific about what jewelry she is wearing when he leaves that morning. 
you are going to hear that Lacey's diamond ring was actually in the shop that day. You're also going to hear that her diamond earrings were never found and the diamond necklace that she almost always wore was found at the house. Scott never changes the description that he gives out about the clothing that he says Lacey is wearing. He tells Officer Evers that, tells Detective Brocchini that, tells Detective Grogan that the next day. And in fact, that's the description that goes out on all of the reward posters and everything else. That when he left Lacey, Lacey was wearing black pants and a white top. In fact, you're going to hear that. You are likely going to hear numerous people called in saying they saw Lacey that day wearing, walking around Modesto, wearing black pants and a white shirt. You're going to hear when Lacey was murdered. She was found in khaki. You're going to hear that when Lacey was murdered, she was found in khaki colored maternity pants. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Go to one of two. Okay, I guess he has pictures here. You can see that he says that he told Officer Evers when he went home after 9.30, went fishing, he then returned home about 4.30, discovered his wife missing. Okay, click out. You have this. Go to the slide. He says that he drives to his shop, does a little bit of work there. He sends an email. He does some other things. He says he picks up his boat. Go ahead and click on that boat. That's the boat in the trailer I was talking about earlier, where the man is standing right there is the office. That's the door that comes in. And here is Scott's boat. Hold on, guys. I actually was throwing off these chew toy and I hit the light again and turned it off. I'm a damn good uh, shot. Aim, <laughs> I am. I'm a damn good shot. Now if I can just like the light switch, turn it on. There we go. Okay. Okay. Da -da. Okay, go ahead. He says he drives almost 90 miles, like I told you, to the Berkeley Marina. The overview, what the Berkeley Marina looks like. Go to the next. And they're showing slides at this point. So hang on here. I don't think we have the slides. I don't think they were in on the site. I'm not sure. But anyway, this is the boat launch area. You can see that there, there are three launch docks that where you, when you park your car, there's a little ticket dispenser that you buy right here. I don't know if you're familiar with how to launch a boat. The way you do it, you just back your boat down, put your truck there on the ramp, put the ball, uh, put them both in the water, the trailer underneath, un unload the boat, tie it up to the dock, and then go back to the parked car. That's how you do it. Click out of that. He says he arrives at 1254. I think, ladies and gentlemen, he arrives at 1240. Here is how. Click on the next one. Two of two. Here's the actual ticket that Scott gave Detective Brocchini that said he got from the Berkeley launch ramp, that he said he got from the Berkeley launch ramp. You can see, welcome, Berkeley Marina. The time he arrived is 12.54 p.m. December 24th. Cost $5 to launch a boat there. Expired 11.59 Tuesday night, basically the same day, December 24th. Go ahead, click that. You're going to hear evidence it is very unusual for someone to have launched a boat at the Berkeley Marina on December 24th. When the police went there later on the 27th, they asked the marina employees, can you run, can you run a receipt that shows how many people bought tickets to launch boats during this period of time? Can you run it for the 24th? Yes, we can. It's actually, we can do it. We can run it for uh, from the last time we ran it, which is December 23rd, you will see. The first, they first, the last, and this doesn't make sense, they first, they last, ran on December 23rd. When the detective went there on the 27th at 8.57, they ran off all tickets to see how many people launched boats and paid a $5 fee to launch a boat. Between December 23rd and December 27th, only three people launched a boat at the Berkeley Marina, one of which was the defendant. You just saw the ticket before. The defendant and two other people were the only ones that launched boats at the Berkeley Marina and paid launch fees between the dates of December 23rd and all the way to the 27th. Now, I thought they determined that he was the only one that did it on the 24th, but I could, could no, be wrong. there were witnesses and stuff. That's all okay, I mean. yeah. okay, got it. He says he gives very spe a very specific description about what he takes, where he takes his boat. He says he pilots his boat from Berkeley Marina to an island two miles north. This is his exact words. 
He says two miles north to an island covered in trash with a broken down pier and a no landing sign. There is only one location in the entire San Francisco Bay that meets that description. That's an island called Brooks Island. This, you're going to see these pictures a million times in this trial. We're going to start right here. Right here is the Berkeley Marina. This was an aerial photograph that was taken in the same time in 2003. I think it was taken in September. Just we get the aerial view. You can see it was the vegetation is all dead. It's the end of the summer. But this is just the aerial view. view. So you will see what it looks like. Here's the Berkeley Marina. It's almost exactly two miles north of the island, Brooks Island. Just for further reference, Lacey's body washed ashore right here. Connor Peterson's body washed ashore right here. Here is Brook, Brooks Island area. We're going to look at it right here after the tip of the island. Don't click yet. So here is where we are. Here is a particular location right at the tip. You can see there is trash there. There's a no landing sign. This is the very tip of Brooks Island. We're going to be looking at it there. Next pictures we're going to look at, we're heading this way towards the main part of that island, or as you are looking at it, off to the left. Okay, hang on here, let me pull this up. There's more debris all along the island. There is kind of a gravelly beach along Brooks Island, another large no, uh, no landing sign right here. And you can see there's a big prominent no landing sign. Again, we were together slightly further down. I didn't put a picture in slightly further down. As we're setting here off to go to the left, there's a broken down pier. Okay. So the defendant says he got his boat. He got out fishing at Berkeley Marina. He says he left at 930. We talked about that. At 1018 in the morning, Karen Service is backing her car out of the driveway. Karen is the next door neighbor to Scott and Lacey. And uh, let's see. Karen Service is right. Take a look at the street, up the street. Karen Service is to the right. She is the house right next door to the house to the left of my right. The other side is owned by Kristen and Greg Reed. The same Kristen Reed that I told you drove by. It's owned by Greg Reed's grandmother. Karen Service uh, at 1018 is backing her car out of the driveway. There's a picture where she looks like so familiar with her. Click on that. She says she is backing out. She finds Scott's dog, Mackenzie, and she's familiar with the dog from living next door, standing in the street right directly in front of her house. Here's Scott's home. Right here is the Reed's grandmother's home. Karen Service house is here. This is her car. It's kind of hard to hear all this because we don't have the pictures. Now, Karen Service initially tells officer tells the officer, let me tell you what she does with the dog. She goes out, she stops her car, and she gets the dog. And the dog has a leash on. She bends down, calls him, or picks up the leash, takes the dog, and tries to put him in the front gate. Find, she finds that it's locked, goes around the driveway. And you'll see where that is in a minute, and goes around to the backyard with the dog, holding the dog, kind of pulling him along and goes all the way to the backyard, walks around, keeps calling for anybody. Is anybody here? Kind of, I found your dog. No answer. She leaves the dog and leaves the leash attached. When she gets to the side gate, it's open. She walks into an open gate with the dog. She leaves the dog there with the leash attached and shuts the door, shuts the gate behind her. She originally tells police this. When the police come, he gets a hold of her. She says, well, you know, yeah, they said, did anything. She said, I found the dog in the street. And she said she originally tells him that that was that. She states she originally found it at 1030. She then gets a call from Scott sometime. I think it's the next day on the 27th. And on the 27th, that wouldn't be right. That doesn't make sense. Should be the uh, 25th anyway. And asks her with respect to her cell phone and says, you know, are you sure about what time you found the dog? Can you be sure? She kind of starts thinking about it. She thinks about what she did that morning. She knows that she, after she put the dog in, she went back inside her house and washed her hands because the leash was wet and had kind of grass and dirt and stuff on it. She went back inside and washed her hands 
and put the dog away, washed her hands, got back in her car and drove downtown. It's not far. I don't know, maybe a mile or two and tried to get back and tried to get to the bank. She said she drove around the parking lot, but couldn't find a place to park. She was planning to go to a Christmas store, which is in a different location downtown. She drove around the bank parking lot. She went to a place called Austin's Christmas store. She brought a couple of items. She went right back. She knew what she wanted, bought a couple of items and came out. She realized that she kept the receipt from Austin's Christmas store. So she said, I wonder if it has using it basically until Christmas, of course. Again, some of this typing is weird, you guys. Then the then he received, and that's what it uh, and that's what remains for the entire time. He's he's the time on it. I, this is all screwed up. Anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it just like it's written, and it doesn't make any sense. So here we go. And you're going to hear from the guy who runs Austin's Christmas store that the receipt that he uses for his Christmas store, he actually runs a patio store. Okay, that does make sense. He actually runs a patio store, and then during Christmas time, he opens up a Christmas store next door. With that, when he opens that Christmas store, he sets the cash register receipt by calling time. He calls up time, gets it, and sets the time in the cash register. And based on that, she backtracked from 1034 from the Christmas store. He sets the cash register receipt by calling time, calls up time, gets it, and sets the time in the cash register. And based on that, she backtracked from 1034. And she realized, I found the dog really more like 1015 to 1018, something like that. Hold on one second here. Okay. Uh, Judge, Mr. Destasso, uh, we'll take a morning recess, blah, blah, blah. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, let's see. It's apparent the court that the opening statement is going to take longer than the estimated two hours. So it looks like we're going to go into the afternoon with the opening statement of the prosecutor. So we'll just go along with the program. So I'll tell you what, we're going to stop right there. Okay. So they take a break. So basically, let me tell you what they're establishing. They're establishing when she actually found Mackenzie. And they're establishing when Scott actually left. And um, Scott just threw out these times that were not even correct. And they were able to tell based on the cell phone towers that he was calling to get his voicemail uh, the time that he actually left. But here's something interesting. And maybe they bring it up later in the opening argument or opening statement. When they went to Scott's warehouse, his storage unit, and Scott said, there's no electricity, Detective Rokini didn't even question him. There was electricity, and Rokini was so mad at himself that he just didn't try a light switch. But there was electricity. Scott just lied because he didn't want him to see everything. And so he just lied. Again, Scott not realizing what type of case this was going to turn into, you know, so there was uh, lighting in the warehouse where the boat was, but Scott lied. And why he thought they yeah. wouldn't find out is beyond me. I'm sorry, insightful. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just agreeing with you. You know, so we'll stop there. They're taking a recess. We'll take a recess here. And let me get back here. Here we go. Anyway. Uh, so... That Yeah, so they're going to, uh, they'll find out that Scott lied about the electricity in the warehouse. That's just one of the many lies that they're going to find out. So, oh, thank you, Sandra Halford. That's very sweet. Very, very sweet. Yeah, we're just going to, um, definitely going to read the opening and closing of both. And I'd like to read when Sharon Rocha was on the stand and her victim's impact statement. There's some things we're going to read uh, throughout the coming weeks here as we wait for the judge to decide whether to allow the testing of the DNA from the uh, LA Innocence Project. But again, everybody, when and I'll put the link up to the court document filed by the LA Innocence Project. When you read that, you go, oh my God, they didn't give him a fair trial. It's so awful. Remember, they had the names of the witnesses that claimed they saw Lacey walking Mackenzie, and they never called them. 
because they knew that it wasn't that the witnesses weren't weren't going to say what they wanted them to say. So anyway, yeah. anyway, there's so much more. I mean, you know, I'm thinking I I listened or I read Sharon Roche's book every now and then, even though I've read it a million times because it's so powerful. And I'll never forget, and I've told this before, but when Scott, when they're down at the search center at the Marriott, and they're in this this like little room that's like a half circle, and Scott Scott's trying to act like a human, but he doesn't have human emotions, okay? Because all of that was buried by the way he was raised. He wasn't allowed to have an opinion. He always had to please his mother. So he's trying to do what he thinks a human would do. And he announces that he's hired a dog psychic to come and talk to Mackenzie to get information to help find Lacey. And Sharon and everybody just freaked out. They're like, no, you're not. You know, he, he was going to pay for the psychic to come in, put her up in a hotel, the whole thing. And they're like, uh-uh, no, absolutely. Yeah, out of everything he could have done, that's the only thing. Yeah, that's what he came yeah. up with, you know. Yeah. So it's just absolutely crazy. Okay, does anybody have any questions, anything? Um, because I probably can't answer them, but Insightful One will. She remembers <laughs> everything, and I don't. So. Yeah, I wish. Oh, you, it's you my are life's so quest, which will never happen, you know. Yeah. No matter how much you learn, you can never know it all. But well, it's fun true. to keep learning. And you do. You are so good at that. You are just Thank excellent. You. Now, tomorrow night, we have another treat. You're going to be talking to us about um, uh, about uh, an old true crime story that you're going to fill us in on. And I'm really excited. Uh, do you have the... Do you have it yet? You were going through a couple of them. I don't know if you actually chose one yet. Oh, yeah. It's um, one of the worst domestic violence cases I've ever That's heard right. of. It's from the UK. Um, it is, honest to God, the most horrific really? thing ever. So people be prepared for it. And I'm choosing a lot of UK cases, first of all, because I think they're really important. Yes. And people need to be remembered. Um, yes. And we need to learn from them, but also because... It's cases a lot of people aren't aware of, and I don't want to go through the same case everybody knows. You know? Right, and exactly, and we don't know a lot of the UK ones, and they do have some fascinating cases. Um, about the anchor, if I remember correctly, they only found one, and it looked like he made either five or six of them. Um, am I misremembering? No, they said he there was um, the marks where he made five, right, and one was missing. I mean, four were missing. Four were missing, right. Yeah, they found one, right? Yeah, yeah that they was found it. only one, right? So they right. think the other ones were made. Speculation is to weigh down Lacey's body, right? That's what they think he tried to use to weigh her down. So. Yeah, the other ones just freaking vanished out of nowhere. I guess that happens a lot with anchors. I've never heard of it, but yeah, yeah. Well, so. it, yeah, he tied it probably around her. You know, her arms were missing, her head was missing, her legs were missing, and my guess is that's where he tied the anchors around. So that uh, that would that would just be be my guess so we shall see okay everybody i think ping's doing a second show tonight uh, be sure be sure if you go to ping's be sure and subscribe try to get to ping to a thousand okay yeah and, and so anyway um i'm losing my voice so tomorrow night i'll tell you about uh dna solves and the case that we're raising money for i'm afraid i won't be able to do it tonight but i'll put the link in the description so if you can donate that would be great to help solve these cases of these unidentified remains so they can go home to their families. Again, I'll put that link in the description. And I want to thank Moonlight View and Four Sons Mom. Thank you so much. Love and Coco, hope to see you soon. Paying the router, we love you. And Insightful One, couldn't do this without you. So we'll see you tomorrow night, everybody, 1030 Eastern on Web Sleuths YouTube Live. We'll see ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.